ಸರ್ವೋಪನಿಷದೋ ಗಾವೋ ದೋಗ್ಧಗೋಪಾಲನಂದನ ಪಾರ್ಥೋವತ್ಸ ಸುಧೀರ್ ಭೋಕ್ತ ದುಗ್ಧ ಗೀತಾಮೃತ ಮಹತ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ತ್ ಲಕ್ಷರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಗವದ್ ಗೀತಾ ಲಕ್ಷರ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಅಂಟಿಲ್ ನಾವು ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಹೆಸ್ ಟೋಲ್ಡ್ ಅರ್ಜುನ್ ದಟ್ ದಿ ಇಂಟೈರ್ ಬೇಸಿಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಗೀತಾ ಇಸ್ ಯೋಗ ಯೋಗ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಷನ್ ವೆನ್ ವಿ ಫೋಕಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕಲ್ಟೀಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಬಾಡಿ ಅವರ್ ಬ್ರೆಥ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅವರ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಒನ್ ಪರ್ಪಸ್ ದಟ್ ಪರ್ಪಸ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಗಾಡ್ ದೆನ್ ವಿ ರೀಚ್ ದಿ ಅಪಿಡಮಿ ಆಫ್ ಯೋಗ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಟೆಪ್ ಆಫ್ ಯೋಗ ಇಸ್ ಸಮಾಧಿ ಇನ್ ಸಮಾಧಿ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅ ಕಾನ್ಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಅ ಕಾನ್ಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಯೋಗ ವಿತ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಭಗವದ್ ಗೀತಾ ಅರ್ಜುನ್ ಮೇಕ್ಸ್ ಮೆನಿ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಆರ್ಗ್ಯುಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ವೈ ಹಿ ಡಸನ್ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಫೈಟ್ ದ ವಾರ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಹೆಸ್ ಹರ್ಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ಗ್ಯುಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅರ್ಜುನ್ ಬಟ್ ಹೀಸ್ ಹರ್ಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ಗ್ಯುಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ನೋಯಿಂಗ್ ವೇರ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ಗ್ಯುಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಕಮ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಹಿ ಟೆಲ್ಸ್ ಅರ್ಜುನ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ರೀಸನ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಹೀಸ್ ಎಟ್ ಫಾಲ್ಟ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಹಿ ಟೆಲ್ಸ್ ಅರ್ಜುನ್ ಶ್ರುತಿ ವಿ ಪ್ರತಿಪನ್ನಾ ತೆ ಯದಾ ಸ್ಥಾಸ್ಯತಿ ನಿಶ್ಚಲ ಸಮಾಧಾವ್ ಅಚಲ ಬುದ್ಧಿಸ್ ತದಾ ಯೋಗಂ ಅವಾಪ್ಸಿಸಿ saying the latter half of this shlok slightly different he says samadho achala buddhi in samadhi when your mind is completely focused tada then you will have attained yog yogam avapsisi before the mahabharat war ever took place dhrutarashtra sent a messenger to meet the pandavas and krishna bhagwan and the messenger took the message from dhrutarashtra duryodhan and in that dhrutarashtra has sent a message These are the reasons why we shouldn't have a war. That if we fight a war, all of these people will die. All of these men will die and all of their women will become widows. All of these widows will have to find other husbands. All of these children will become orphans. What will happen to the world, etc., etc., etc. All of the arguments that Arjun is giving to Krishna Bhagwan in the first chapter of the Gita have been given to him, have been fed to him through the words of this messenger. And Krishna Bhagwan realizes this and that's why he tells him that Arjun your mind right now has become confused upon hearing so many different arguments from so many different people shruti vi pratipanna te your mind is confused throughout many of these lectures we've always focused on the words that we're hearing if we hear negative words then we have negative thoughts and we hear positive words we have positive thoughts if we hear words of weakness then we become weak and if we hear words of strength then we become strong In the same way Krishna Bhagwan is telling Arjun right now you've heard so many words like this against war countering your morals and values that you're confused what's important to understand from this couplet is that we need to understand what we're reading we're very cautious about the food we put in our body it should be organic it should be healthy we're very cautious about the water we drink it should be pure it should be filtered but what about all the garbage that we feed our mind we're not focused on that Bhagwan Swami Narayan's first spiritual successor Gunati Tanan Swami in his guidance he gives an example he says there was a calf that was separated from its mother cow the calf wanted to drink milk but instead of reaching the cow shed the calf reached where all the bulls were kept and every time it put its mouth forward to find some udders instead of finding milk it got kicked in the face 1 2 3 5 10 times it was kicked in the face eventually the calf's entire face was swollen Slowly it made its way to the cow shed found its mother but by the time it reached its mother its mouth was so swollen it couldn't drink any of its own mother's milk Gunati Tanan Swami explains with this example he says we want to go to God and receive his guidance but before we go to God we go to so many different people to learn about morals and values and each of those people with their guidance is actually just kicking us in the face Eventually by the time we reach God we're so swollen our minds are so swollen that God's guidance has no place in it let me give you another example if you have a car and something goes wrong you're supposed to take it back to the manufacturer to get it repaired but you have an alternative you can take it to a different manufacturer you can take your car to a different manufacturer and get it repaired there they'll repair it it may even be cheaper But eventually if you take your car back to its original manufacturer when they open the hood and they look at the engine they'll say that we're not going to repair this anymore the warranty is void why 
Because you took our car, our product to someone else and they put their parts in it. Because you put somebody else's parts in our product, then the warranty is void. You can only take the car that has, you can only take your car to its manufacturer because that manufacturer made it. In the same way, I want to ask you a question, who made you? Buddhi Indriyo Mana Pranan Jananam Us Rujat Prabhu God made us. God made our minds, our intellect, our thoughts, our so everything. God made our bodies and everything in it. Now if we take that and we adjust our minds, our morals, according to somebody else, and then we take our same mind and morals back to God and we say, okay, God, I want you to guide me. I want you to help me. God will open the hood and He'll say, you've got somebody else's parts in here. The warranty is void. So that doesn't happen. Krishna Bhagwan is telling Arjun that when it comes to morality and values, focus your mind on just one person, God. A few years ago, I was traveling in the UK. At that time, I was doing a discourse on the Srimad Bhagavad Gita in an area called Brent near our Nizden temple. One day before going to the discourse, a person came to meet me at the Nizden temple. He was a person from South India and in his hand was the Srimad Bhagavad Gita. He had a few questions based on what he had heard in the discourse. So we had a small discussion, about 30 to 45 minutes. And at the end of the discussion, I was actually very happy to see someone in a foreign country who had studied the Gita so much that actually had questions when I would describe and define different couplets from it. So I asked him that you live in this foreign country and you've been here for so many years. What inspires you to maintain your morals, your culture, your values? And he told me a story. He said, from the moment I was born, my mother and father never let me read anything. They would read everything first. And if they approved of it, then they would let me read it. And when I say everything, he meant everything. He said, even I wasn't allowed to read the mail. A brochure came, I wasn't allowed to read it. When I was young, my parents were very strict in what I read because they wanted to make sure that I was never confused by any other scriptural knowledge, by any other person's philosophy. He told me that his father was of a nature that if any other sadhu sannyasi came to his house, he would happily feed them. His father would converse with the sadhu sannyasi and they would discuss philosophy and religion, but he would never be allowed to be in the same room. His father thought he wasn't mature enough. Even years later, when he wanted to start attending services at the Nizden Temple, he first called his father, asked him if it was okay for him to attend a BAPS Swaminarayan organization assembly. His father said, send me their scriptures. The man said, I sent him the Vachnamrutan Swamini Vato. He read through the entire scripture and then he agreed that your philosophy, your aspects of devotion and wisdom are in line with my aspects of devotion and wisdom as a Hindu. And only then did my father give me the green light that I could come here to this temple. So I took it as almost just a cross question. I said, isn't it a bit of fanaticism that your father censored everything you read? He said, no. My father didn't limit any amount of knowledge in math or science or history or technology, engineering, any of those things. My father was more than happy that I read as much as I wanted. But when it came to morality, when it came to values, when it came to a sense of identity, who I am as a Hindu, my father wanted to make sure from a young age that I maintained that identity. When I was young, I was immature and I thought that my father may be overreacting. But now as an adult, I realized that everything my father did was to protect me. It wasn't to keep me hidden from the world. In the same way, what we read has an impact on us. What we let our children read has an impact on them. We have to be very cautious with what we read. Krishna Bhagwan is telling Arjun that because your mind is so confused in what you've read until now, you haven't been able to focus. And all of these arguments have been given to you by someone else. You're just regurgitating something that you've heard. But when you can focus your mind, then you'll reach samadhi. And in samadhi, that's when you'll attain yoga. Hearing the word samadhi and hearing the word yoga, Arjun then responds with a question to Sri Krishna Bhagavan. He says, Stita pragnasya ka bhasha? Samadhi stasya keshava? Stita de kim prabhasheta? Kima sita vrajeta kim? He's heard the word Samadhi and Arjun asked Krishna Bhagwan, that person who is in Samadhi, Samadhista, what is that person like? How does he walk? How does he talk? Tell me about him. How does he walk and how does he talk? Don't just mean language and action. It means everything about him. Tell me how this person is. 
Arjun isn't asking about someone in the scriptures. Arjun isn't asking about some figment or some imagination. Arjun is asking me, tell me about someone in this world. Tell me how they live their day-to-day -day life. Someone who has this samadhi. Having samadhi doesn't mean that they are still in action. A person in samadhi can be just like us, moving, walking, talking, breathing, eating. But how do they behave? For the next 17 couplets, Sri Krishna Bhagwan is going to describe those features. The first thing Arjun asks is, what is his language? Sita pragnasya ka bhasha? Sita dihi kim prabhasheta? How does he speak? What is his language? Why does he ask this? There's an anecdote to explain. One time in King Akbar's kingdom, a polyglot came. A polyglot is someone who knows multiple languages. That person came and he said that, King Akbar, I've heard that you have many different ministers here and some of the ministers are some of the most intelligent in all of India. But I have a challenge for you today. If your ministers can tell me what is my native tongue, then I'll believe that they are truly the most intelligent in all of India. If I win and they can't find my native tongue, then you have to give me 500,000 rupees tomorrow. King Akbar, he said, fine. My ministers are so intelligent, they'll be able to figure out your native tongue. And then one by one, the ministers in the assembly hall started to ask this visitor questions. One person asked questions in Hindi and the visitor started answering in Hindi, fluent Hindi. Another person asked in Sanskrit and the visitor started answering in fluent Sanskrit. English, German, French, Japanese, Mandarin, any and every language you can imagine. Eventually, all the ministers ran out of information. They didn't know what to ask. When it came time for the minister named Birbal to ask his question, Birbal said, I'll ask tomorrow morning. Until then, we're going to take a recess. The visitor went to his room. In the evening, he had his dinner and he went to sleep. Akbar was worried that Birbal hasn't asked any questions. How is he going to figure out the native language of our visitor? Otherwise, I'm going to be out of 500,000 rupees tomorrow. At night, while the visitor was asleep, he was sleeping on one side. Birbal went into his room. He took a feather and he rubbed it on one cheek. The man turned around. Birbal took the feather and he just touched it to the other cheek and the man turned around. He kept tossing and turning three, four times. Eventually, when Birbal touched the feather to the visitor's cheek, the visitor said, And then he went back to sleep. The next morning, when the visitor came to collect his 500,000 rupees, Birbal said, I already know your native language. The visitor said, what is it? Birbal said, it's Gujarati. The visitor was amazed. He said, you're right. How did you know? And at that time, Birbal explained. He said, when a man is frustrated, when he has nothing else to resort to, when a person is angry and frustrated, the language he speaks, that's his native tongue. Think about this yourself. When you get very angry, the language you resort to, those are your native tongues. It's not just language, those are your terms. Those are the words that you use. That's the way you think. Arjun is asking all of these questions here because I want to see this person. Why does he want to see the actions of this person? So that we can mimic them in real life. As we go through not all, but some of the different couplets of Stita Pragna, the qualities, the virtues, we're also going to take different stories throughout to better understand them. These incidents are from real people. And by learning about other real people and how they've behaved, we can better mimic them. The scriptures tell us, Atma va are shrotavya, mantavya, nididhyasitavya. Atma in the Brihadaranik Upanishad in this chapter means Paramatma. When you learn about God or the God realized Sant, and you constantly contemplate upon them, and you try to imbibe those virtues in your life, then Sakshatkar, you become enlightened. Those virtues are instilled in our lives. Just seeing somebody else behave and contemplating about it can help us imbibe those virtues in our lives. Now this is scripture. But in 2009, science finally caught up to scripture. There's a professor by the name of Dr. Vilayanur Ramachandran, who in 2009 was at the University of California. His work is predominantly on the brain and he explained that the brain is a roughly three pound piece of flesh. But it's unique in the sense that this piece of flesh, this lump, can contemplate all values from zero all the way to infinity. It can philosophize about its self-existence and the existence of God. 
and there are more neurological connections in the brain than there are particles of dust in the entire universe. Now, this is all history. This is all old research. But then Dr. Vilayana Ramachandran, he explained that until this point, science has proven one thing, that when a person performs a certain action, there are neurons in the brain that fire. If I reach my hand out, there are neurons in my brain that fire because I'm reaching my hand out. Again, that was all science up to 2009. And then in 2009, Dr. Ramachandran and his team, they presented new information. The new information shown just watching somebody else put their hand out also fires the same neurons in your brain. So if I'm touching my hand right now and you're watching this, the same neurons that are firing in my brain are also firing in your brain. And because of this, we have that virtue of empathy. We can empathize when other people are hurt, even emotionally. What this tells us is that if you thought until now that you had to yourself do an action to get the habit, that's one thought. But even watching somebody else do an action will help us imbibe that habit. Seeing how somebody else has karma yoga, gnan yoga, and bhakti yoga in their lives will help us automatically imbibe karma yoga, gnan yoga, and bhakti yoga in our lives. And that's why Arjuna is asking Krishna Bhagwan, tell me about this person so I can mimic him. In the very first quality, the first shlok describing the qualities of someone who is tita pragna, Krishna Bhagwan tells Arjun, prajahati yada karman. Sarvan partha manogatan, atmanyev atmana tushta, stita pragnas tadochete. Someone who has given up all of their desires and is completely satisfied in their soul, atmani, with the form of God, atmana. The second atmana refers to paramatmana, not self satisfaction, but satisfaction because they've attained the biggest thing in the entire world, God Himself. In our lives, we only have desires because we're unsatisfied with what we have. We can only give up all of our mental desires. Prajahati yada kaman sarvan partha manogatan. We can only give up all desires when we are completely satisfied. Tushtaha. And when we have that, we've attained the quality of stita pragna. Ved Vyas, the writer of the Mahabharata, is also the writer of 18 different Puranic scriptures. In every single one of Vyasa's scriptures, he's included one common story, the story of King Gayati. And that means that in every scripture, the entryway to learn about any avatar, to learn how to do devotion of any dev or any devi, we have to first learn the story of Yayati. I'm going to tell you the story of King Yayati based on the Bhagavat in the ninth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavat. There's the story of King Yayati, but let me first lay out some of the characters. There's King Vrusha Parva. King Vrusha Parva's family guru is Shukra Acharya. King Vrusha Parva's daughter, her name is Sharmishta. And Shukra Acharya's daughter, her name is Devyani. Sharmishta and Devyani are best friends. They've grown up together. They've constantly played together. Now one day, as teenagers, They've gone to the lake and they're taking a bath. And they get the news that Shankar Bhagwan is going to be passing by the lake soon. They're both slightly embarrassed that they're there alone and they're both naked and they're taking this bath. So they quickly get out of the lake, they dry themselves off and they put their clothes on. But the mistake that was made is that Sharmishta, in her hurry, wore Devyani's clothes. It shouldn't have been a problem. They're good friends. But for whatever reason, that day Devyani became vexed. Devyani is the daughter of Shukracharya. She's a Brahman. So she tells Sharmishta, What are you thinking? Do you know who I am? I am the daughter of a Brahman, thus I am a Brahman. Indra, one of the greatest devtas in the entire world, comes and touches our feet. Everything we do is considered holy. You need us in your first rituals when you're born. You need us in your last rituals when you die. You can't do anything in this life without our blessing. And you have the gall to wear my clothes? You should be embarrassed. You should be ashamed of yourself. And with these words, she said her speech. And Vyashti describes that Sharmishta started to breathe so heavily, she started making the sound as if you had hit a snake with a stick. And then she got angry. And she started her speech. 
and she started with the Mangla Charan. Beggar? You're telling me? Do you know who I am? You people are like dogs. The way there are dogs outside of my house and they wait for me to finish my dinner so that I can throw them the leftover food. You and your entire family live off my leftovers. You eat the food we give you, you wear the clothes we give you. Everything you have is because of us. You have no right to even look at me. And with this anger, Sharmishta pushed Devyani into a nearby well. She left. Devyani is in the well. Sometime later, King Yayati, he was passing by. He was with a group of his friends and they were out hunting. He was thirsty at the time, so he stopped by the well and he stuck his hand in the well. He wanted water, but Devyani grabbed his hand. He pulled her out. Devyani told Yayati, well, you've held on to my hands, so hold on all the time. Let's get married. That's it. That's all it took. <laughs> no coffee, nothing. Love at first sight, Yayati and Devyani decide that they'll get married to each other. But Devyani is angry and she wants revenge. She feels that she'll be satisfied if she gets revenge. Negative thought. One negative thought and it just started to take over her mind. She went back to her father and she said, I want you to curse the king, Vrushaparva. Him and his entire family and his entire kingdom should be killed. The king, Vrushaparva, he folded his hands, Shukracharya, please, whatever you want, whatever you want, you can have, but don't curse me or my kingdom. Don't curse my family. Shukracharya said, it's not in my hands. My daughter is the one upset. You have to make her happy. The king folded his hands to this teenage girl and he said, Devani, what do you want? Devani thought that she would be fulfilled if she got revenge against Sharmishta. So she said, I've just gotten married. I want Sharmishta, the princess, and her 1,000 handmaids to come to my house and become servants. King said, fine, that has to take it. Just leave us alone. And thus, Sharmishta had to go with 1,000 of handmaids to become servants in Devyani's house. Time passed. Yayati and Devyani, husband and wife, they have multiple children. But over time, Yayati and Sharmishta, they also started to have an illicit affair. And in their affair, they also had some children. Sharmishta did her best to hide those children from Devyani. But one day, it so happened that while Devyani was outside, she saw her husband at a distance. And this boy, who wasn't her son, started running behind Yayati. Daddy, daddy, daddy. She thought to herself, who is this boy, who is not my son, calling my husband, dad? And she got angry. So I do some research. She sent her spies. She found out all the information. She went back to her father. And she said, I want you to curse Yayati now. Shukracharya came to King Yayati and he said, you are such an animal. You have so much desire for the pleasure, so I'm going to curse you with something worse than death. I curse you with vruddhatva. I curse you to become an old man. Yayati was confused at first. Like, Why would you curse me to become old? If you want me to suffer, just kill me. He's like, no. There's something worse than suffering. I want you to become old because if you become old, angam galitam, palitam mundam, dashanavihinam jatam tundam, vruddho yati gruhitva dandam, tadapina munchati asha pindam. You become weak, you become frail, all of your hair will fall out, all of your good looks will disappear, all of the diseases will riddle your body, and yet, all of your desires will remain. You'll have all of the food in front of you, but you'll have diabetes, so you won't be able to enjoy any of it. You'll have all of these women in front of you, but you won't be able to do anything. Everything is going to be in front of you, but this will be an incessant amount of torturing on you. That's why I want you to have it. Yayati was so scared, he folded his hands and he said, Shukracharya, Guru, give me one way out, anything, and I'll take it. Shukracharya laughed and he said, I'll give you one option. You have multiple children. You can exchange your old age for the youth of one of your children. If one of your children is willing to exchange with you, then you can exchange for 1,000 years. Then Yayati, father, goes to his own son, Puru, and begs him, change with me. I have so many desires for, with your mother, so many desires for food, so many desires for things to see in this world that I want your youth. And in exchange, you suffer old age. Puru was a good son, and he accepted the exchange. And Yayati, for 1,000 years, enjoyed himself. When he finished eating one thing, he started eating another. And when he finished watching one movie, he started watching another. And when he finished in one place, he went to another. And when he finished in one after the other after the other. 1,000 years passed in this way. 
And when the last day came, he went back to his son. And his son asked him a very important question. His son asked, Dad, for 1,000 years, you've eaten to your heart's content. You've seen everything. You've done everything. For 1,000 years, are you satisfied? And then hear what Yayati says. Yayati, this one couplet is in every single Hindu scripture. Whether it be the Mahabharat or the Bhagavat or the Devi Bhagavat, this exact couplet is in every single scripture. Yayati says, Na jhatu kama kama nam upabhogena shamyati havisha krishna bhartmeva bhuya eva bivartate If there's a candle and you keep putting wax there, the candle won't go out. It will continue to burn brighter and brighter. In the same way, by fulfilling one's desires, those desires aren't lessened. They just keep getting stronger and stronger. There is no limit to us fulfilling our desires. Bhagwan Swami Narayan, in his scripture, the Vachnamrit, he gives an example that if you split this entire world open and you try to fill it up, it is impossible. In the same way, for infinite births before this, you have enjoyed countless sense pleasures, but you have never been satisfied. And if he had stopped giving his guidance here, that would have been okay. But then the next statement that Bhagwan Swami Narayan says is, for infinite births, you have never been satisfied. And you will never be satisfied. And you will never be satisfied. Guru Mahan Swami Maharaj explains that this isn't Bhagwan giving us a curse. This is his blessing. He's opening our eyes. And then he gives an example based on these just last few words. This example is based on road and traffic rules. But it's different. This example works better for India than here in the Western world because in the East and in the West, we have roads and traffic laws. But in the West, the laws are the laws. The rules are the rules. And in the East, the rules are more or less just requests. In India, if there's a red light, it's more or less just asking you, here's a red light, please stop your car. So this works better for India. Mahan Swami Maharaj explains that if you're in central India and you want to drive north towards Delhi, if you get in your car and start driving and you see a sign that says Mumbai, then you realize at that moment you're in the wrong direction. You're headed south when you want to be heading north. Mahan Swami Maharaj asks a question, how long will you continue on the wrong road? 100 miles? 200 miles? 500 miles? No. In India, the moment you realize you're in the wrong direction, you stop your car, no matter where you are, you will drive over the divider between the roads, and then you will turn around and head back in the opposite direction. Mahan Swami Maharaj explains, for infinite births, here we are thinking that if we fulfill our desires, we'll have happiness. And Bhagwan Swami Narayan here, Yayati in the scriptures, Ved Vyas, Krishna Bhagwan, everyone is telling us, you will never be satisfied. Now, accept it. Cut on the road and turn back. Until now, we've only studied one quality of Stita Pragna. We'll continue with various other qualities in the next lecture. Until then, I pray that we can understand and imbibe these messages of Sri Krishna Bhagwan. Focus on understanding our morality and values only from the words of God and the scriptures. And understand that our desires will never be fulfilled if we keep following after worldly pleasure. Instead, let's focus all of our energies onto God and His God-realized Son. Astu.